Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, and the DeKalb Library Foundation, welcome to another in our continuing series of virtual author events. We have some wonderful events to finish out the month of June 2021. So we hope you will register for those events and join us in your living rooms via Zoom for those. On June 28th, we will host Edward Hirsch and poet Ilya Kaminsky for Edward's book, 100 Poems to Break Your Heart. Following that on June 29th, of course, we will close out our very, very popular Jocelyn Jackson Summer Reading Series for 2021. The two featured authors on Tuesday will be Caitlin Greenridge, who wrote Liberty, and Kristen Valdez Quaid, author of The Five Wounds. But as we finish out June, we do have an exciting docket of events coming up in July, starting off on July 1st with Kate Moore. Many of you will remember Kate Moore from 2017. She was the author of Radium Girls and came to the Decatur Library and spoke to a packed auditorium and she and her publicist still talk about the wonderful Georgia welcome that we gave her that afternoon. So she will join us on July 1st for her new book, The Woman They Could Not Silence. If you'd like to see those events or see any more of our events, do go to our Eventbrite page or Facebook and you can sign on and register for those. And if you've missed our events and would like to see them again, just for your viewing pleasure. Don't forget that we've started a YouTube channel that you can find by searching Georgia Center for the Book on YouTube. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the book tonight, Unique Eats and Eateries of Atlanta, Karis Books and More is our bookseller. So we will drop a link to order that book in the chat and you can click an order from that independent bookstore. We always encourage our participants to order from our independent bookstores. They have done so much during this pandemic, mailing books to homes, delivering books to homes, and providing contactless pickup. And now as we begin to emerge, they are doing limited shopping indoors. So we hope you will support our independent bookstores and especially our black owned and operated independent bookstores because they are also very, very vital to our literary community. So this evening, after we finish our formal presentation, if you would like to ask a question, feel free to drop it into the chat, which you can um, locate to the side of your screen or use the Q&A feature, which is the Q&A button at the top or bottom of your screen. And also we have live transcription enabled for those people who do need it. And you can find that by locating the CC button, either at the top or the bottom of the Zoom webinar, depending on your browser. We will be using both the Q&A feature and the chat tonight because we do have some fun and games planned after the presentation. So um, go ahead and take a moment and locate those right now. If you are like me and love food and eating, um, you know Atlanta has truly become one of the great places for it. Georgia has become one of the great states for food production for farm to table. You know, we now have olive groves, we have goat farms, we have, you know, a plethora of you pick farms and things that you can go to to experience wonderful flavors and wonderful ingredients. You know, we all have wonderful stories of that meal that you still talk about across the dinner table years later. And what I love about books like Amanda has given us this evening, is they are like those cookbooks that church lady leagues and junior leagues put together and they have the black plastic spiral bind going down the side. They are part history and part cookbook and you can find them and they are truly treasures. And everywhere you go in the book, you will find something new to be discovered. I went through this afternoon. I'm not sure the exact number of eateries featured in this book. I can tell you that I ticked off 18 of those um, and quite a few more to go um, just by looking down the table of contents, but I am more than willing to accept that particular challenge. So as I mentioned, Amanda Plum, our guest tonight, loves food almost as much as she loves her adopted hometown of Atlanta. 
for several years, along with fellow members of the Buford Highway Suffer Club. She explored the international dining options along that congested thoroughfare and quite a tasty, tasty slate of restaurants all along Buford Highway. If you haven't done it, you need to try it. In 2017, she co-founded Chow Club Atlanta, a monthly underground restaurant showcasing the talents of local home cooks and international roots. Chow Club Atlanta has been featured in the Atlanta Magazine, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, Creative Loafing, and many, many other media outlets. So ladies and gentlemen, will you join me this evening to welcome Amanda Plub as she tells us about the unique eats and eateries of Atlanta. Amanda? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation, Joe. It's really exciting to be here at Georgia Center for the book. And thank you for everyone who's joining tonight. I'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So first of all, find the chat and say hello. Say hi and tell us where you're calling in from. That would be great. Um, and then throughout the talk, I'm gonna try to make it pretty interactive. So go ahead and say hello in the chat so we can hear, see who's here. All right. Now, um, when I was in fourth grade, my dad got offered a job in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And so the whole family went to Rock Hill for a weekend to check out this town to see where we might be moving. We were staying at the Howard Johnson right by the highway, and we asked the woman at the front desk to suggest a good Chinese restaurant. And she told us to go to Rigby's. And we were like, Rigby's? Rigby's is a good Chinese restaurant? And she said, oh, I thought you said a good chain restaurant. Well, that's where it became an instant family classic because even though I was just in elementary school, I knew that if you wanted to get to know a city, you don't go to a chain restaurant. No, you wanna to go to a mom and pop restaurant, a hole in the, the wall. You wanna find the unique eats and eateries because that's really how you're gonna get a sense of a place. And so we did end up moving to Rock Hill. And I have to say there were not a ton of different dining options in the city, but luckily as an adult, I moved here to Atlanta, Georgia. And that was a different story because Atlanta is a city of transplants. There's people from all over the country and around the globe that moved to Atlanta and call it home. And our food scene really reflects that. And as Joe hinted, there's no place better to really get that sense than Buford Highway. So Buford Highway is part of State Route 13, and it goes through Gwinnett, Fulton, and DeKalb counties. And there's over a thousand different immigrant-owned businesses, at least a hundred of which are restaurants. And my friends and I started this thing called the Buford Highway Supper Club. And once a month, we would go up to Buford Highway and we'd pick a different restaurant, a different type of cuisine. And we'd sit at a big table and we'd order lots of dishes and we would just share them. And it was really fun because for a lot of us, it was the only time all month that we saw each other. And we also got to just break bread and try new food, learn about a new culture. My friend Alex was one of the people that was in our group and he was gonna to move to New York City. So we're like, Alex, you get to pick where we're gonna eat this month. And he wanted to go for Ethiopian food. And there's a ton of different international food on Buford Highway, but a lot of it's from Latin America and across Asia. And there really aren't that many Ethiopian restaurants. So I actually called up my friend, Johanna, and um, I asked her, where's the best Ethiopian food in Atlanta? And she said, my house. <laughs> and we laughed, ha ha ha. And then we realized she had a point. So we actually invited all the members of the Buford Highway Supper Club over to my house for dinner and Johanna cooked for us. And everybody loved it. It was a lot of fun. So we did it again and we did an Ethiopian brunch, which was really unusual because there aren't a lot of Ethiopian brunch spots. And that's when Johanna and I realized we were onto something and we started Chow Club Atlanta. And so Chow Club is an underground supper club. Before the pandemic, we would have two dinners a month and we always worked with a different chef. And we really focus on home cooks or people who are starting a small business like a catering company and folks that have international roots. And we would work with them to develop a four or five course menu, sell the tickets online. And then people would come and sit you know, at a big table and get to know each other. Um, and so we've been on hiatus for a while. We're actually about to get started in, um, in August. We're going to have our next dinner. Um, but as you can tell, I really love food and I really love the Atlanta food scene. So when I was asked to write this book, Unique Eats and Eateries of Atlanta, I was ecstatic 
It's part of a series that Reading Press does in different cities, and they always collaborate with a local author to write in. And for me, it's almost like my love letter to Atlanta's food scene. I got to sit down with more than 80 different restaurateurs and chefs and learn their stories, ask the questions that I wanted to know about them, and I'm really excited to share their stories with you. So I'd like to share a few of them with you tonight. Um, and one thing I want to do to make it a little bit more interactive is I'm going to try to tell you the story without telling you the name of the restaurant. And in the chat, I want you to try to guess where I'm talking about. Does that sound good? Okay, so as soon as you know the restaurant, go ahead and put it in the chat um, and we'll see who can guess it first. All right, um, I'll try and set up so I can see the chat over here. All right, so the first um, one I'm going to share with you is actually the first interview I did, and it is the first story that appears in the book. So this is Matt Hinton, Hinton. and Matt is an adjunct professor, and he was at um, Morehouse College. And I don't know if you know much about being an adjunct professor, but one of the things that kind of sucks about it is if you don't have enough students enroll in your class, then your class just gets canceled for the semester. And that's exactly what happened to Matt. This was back in 2008. He was teaching a religion class at Morehouse, didn't get enough students, so the class got canceled. Well, Matt had a wife and kid. He needed that money. He was really counting on it. So what was he going to do? Well, flash back to the 1990s, Matt was living in Atlanta, and he was a regular at a place called Tortillas. Do any of you guys remember Tortillas on Ponce? Any of y'all went to Tortillas? I went there a lot in the 90s. It was this total like grunge alternative place where everybody that worked there had tattoos, they all played in bands, and they had these huge burritos that were so cheap. I believe the bean and cheese burrito was like $2.50. And what was really cool was they would add rice or potatoes for free, which I thought was like the best deal ever. Now that I'm a little older and wiser, I know that potatoes and rice are super cheap and I was actually saving them money by getting these free ingredients in my burritos. But nonetheless, I love tortillas, Matt loved tortillas. And so both of us, along with a lot of other people were devastated when it closed. Um, and that was back in 2003. There was a long line of people waiting to get their last burritos on the last day. One guy got 52 burritos so he could freeze them and have one burrito a week for the rest of the year. Well, one thing they did to all the, for all the fans on that last day is they actually handed out their recipes. So flash forward to 2008, when Matt's got to figure out what he's going to do, he decides to dust off those recipes, which he's never used. And he reaches out to some friends who also remember tortillas and said, hey, would you pay me to make these burritos? And so um, people did. 50 people said that they wanted burritos on that first day. And so he got to work making the burritos and uh, about an hour before he's gonna start delivering them, he burnt the beans. So he had to start all over again. Uh, he was really behind schedule. His last burrito delivery wasn't until 10 p.m., which is not good when people are expecting their burritos for dinner. And it was just like a mess. And the last thing he wanted to do was do this again. But he did, he did it every week for that semester. And I know this because I remember, and I actually got delivery twice. You would like have to email him on Wednesday with your order, and then he would deliver it to you in his van on Monday. Because you have to remember, this was two years before Instagram was even invented. So this was a very early pop-up. This was OG pop-up. Um, but, you know, the burritos were, were really awesome. Does anybody know where I'm talking about? Has anybody guessed where this is? Anyone? Well, I'll tell you what happened to Matt. So he, he did this for a whole semester. He couldn't wait until the next semester when he could go back to teaching. But unluckily for him, lucky for us, his class didn't need enrollment again. So he had to figure out what he was going to do. Was he going to quit or get legit? And he'd been getting all this attention. He was in the paper. He was building this following. So he decided to get a little kiosk in Sweet Auburn Curb Market. And I didn't know this until I interviewed him, but there's a little street behind the curb market that leads into the employee parking lot. And that street is called Bell Street. And this is Bell Street Burritos. Um, and so that's just one of my um, favorite stories, one that I did early on. I will say that, um, that I love to ask people for little tips. And one thing that I learned about Bell Street Burritos is that every Friday they have homemade tamales that their chef Lydia makes. 
Also, they have hand dipped milkshakes, which I thought was really interesting. So, um, awesome. A couple of people, Mona and, and Valley, got it. Awesome. So, the next one. So, one of the things I had to figure out when I was writing this book is like what restaurants to include and which ones not to include. But there's some restaurants that are just so iconic to Atlanta that I just had to include them. And I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about some of those. So this takes us back to 1947 and Robert, I'm not gonna tell you his last name because that will give away the restaurant. Robert was working as a soda jerk at Jacob's Drugstore and it was no located at Atlanta University Center by all the HBCUs. So students from Spelman and Morehouse would come to the drugstore to get food because the food on campus wasn't very good. But honestly, the food at the drugstore was not much better. And Robert really wanted to open his own restaurant because he made great fried chicken, he was a great cook, and he just really wanted to share his food with people. But he didn't have that kind of money to open a restaurant. But unbeknownst to him, his wife, Florine, had been saving his paychecks and actually did have enough money to help him open a restaurant. So they opened a restaurant right across the street from the drugstore and word had gotten out about Robert's fried chicken and there was a huge line of people wanting to get in on the first day, which would have been amazing, except for the fact that the stove broke. That's right, opening day, no stove. So what does Robert do? He picks up the phone and he calls Florine. Florine, I mean, I think this woman is a total boss. She is at home and she just starts cooking. That's right, she cooks all the food for the restaurant in her house. Only problem is the car is at the restaurant. So she actually has to call a taxi and take a taxi to the restaurant. And they do that every day for the first two weeks or so until they actually save up enough money to get a new stove. Well, the restaurant gets really popular. His brother James comes and helps him run it. In 1959, they move across the street to a new space. And in 1960, they open Le Carousel Lounge. And the carousel was an integrated um, music venue where people like Lena Horne, Curtis Mayfield, Gladys Knight, Stevie Wonder, all these greats performed. They also realized that there were not a lot of um, motels or hotels that served African-Americans. In fact, there were only two at the time, and they were both near Sweet Auburn and not near the universities. So they opened a motor hotel that had 120 rooms, swimming pool, ballroom, and meeting rooms. Has anyone guessed where this is? Again, you can use the chat for all participants if you know where it is. Any guesses? I'll need to learn your Atlanta food history. I guess that's why we're here. It so this like we do have a guess in the, oh, we've got a couple of guesses. Awesome, yes, it is Pascal's. Perfect, awesome. So Pascal's, the Motor Hotel and the lounge are no longer there. It's now in a new location over in Castleberry Hill. Another thing that I think is really interesting about um, Pascal's is that they were really active in the civil rights movement. So Martin Luther King Jr., he actually ate their fried chicken when he was a kid. And during the civil rights movement, he went to the brothers, the Pascal brothers, and asked them for some meeting space. And they actually gave him space in the hotel that he could use as a meeting space, just gave him one of the suites. They also would go down to um, bail out the college students once they got arrested and sit-ins and other protests. They would bail them out, bring them to the restaurant for dinner, give them a place to stay for the night and make them call their parents. So it's a really big important part of Atlanta's um, history. And if you're interested in Martin Luther King's favorite meal, I do mention what it was in the book. So you can actually order that. So our next one, this is Mary McKenzie. Her husband died in World War II and she had to figure out a way to support her family. And she was a great cook, but this was 1945. And in 1945, it wasn't really considered proper for a woman to own a restaurant. So instead she opened up a tea room. So her tea room was so popular there'd be these huge lines at lunchtime, which is great if you're in business, but it's not great if you're an employee and you only have a short window to have your lunch before you have to get back to your job. And so one thing she started doing is she would go to the people waiting in line and give them an order form. And people would fill out their order form in line, turn it in. So by the time they got inside the restaurant and got seated, their food would be ready for them. All right. Yes. Several people know this one. So, and if you go there today, so today there's like 500 seats at Mary Max. Good job. Um, so you sometimes still have to wait to get in. 
and you still fill out your order form, except you actually fill it out at the table now. You don't have to wait outside and do it. And if you've never been to Mary Max, be sure to let your um, server know this because they will give you a complimentary cup of pot liquor. And pot liquor is the juice that's left over after making collards. And it's great for dunking your cornbread in. So if it's your first time, make sure that you let them know that. So the oldest restaurant that I talk about in the book opened in 1927. And this is a place where tradition matters a lot. In fact, it matters so much that when the third owner, Jack Clark, decided to sell the restaurant in 1979, he took an ad out in the paper, but he said anybody that was interested in buying had to write an essay. Can you imagine having to write an essay about a business that you want to buy? Well, this guy, Paul Jones, had moved to Atlanta to work at the Cherokee Country Club, but he really wanted to open his own restaurant. So he thought he'd go check this place out. And he took his daughter, Jody, who was nine years old, never been to the restaurant, wanted to check it out. And as soon as he gets there, all the waitresses are like, hey, hun, can I get you anything, hun? So good to see you, hun. And Jody was so confused because she's like, dad, I thought you'd never been here before. How do all these women seem to know you? And it's because it's the type of place where as soon as you go, you're considered a regular. People treat you like your family. So uh, Paul decided he did want to buy the restaurant, but before Jack would sell it to him, he insisted that the two of them go on a road trip to Michigan so he could meet Paul's family and really check him out. So that's how much people cared about the character and the history of this place. Now today, Jody runs this restaurant with her husband and a lot of the staff have been there for decades. The head cook, Sonia, has been there for 40 years. Randall, the greeter, has been there for 32. And Rhea, who has been there since 1972, I mean, that's 49 years. And a lot of things have not changed like the menu. So this is a tomato aspic. And I don't think there's many places in the city where you can find a tomato aspic on the menu. This is congealed Bloody Mary mix with a side of mayonnaise. And yes, one of the only places you can find it is the Colonnade restaurant. So good job. Mona's gonna win all the prizes, y'all. Other people need to step up because Mona is gonna win it all. Um, and uh, the Colonnade is known for their fried chicken. I actually recommend getting the fried liver. It's called Lots of Liver. It's really good. Also, they're known for a very stiff pour over at their bar and really fun, really great customers. Um, they're affectionately known as the Gays and Grays because um, it's in a pretty queer community, but also attracts a lot of old folks and everybody just seems to really get along at the Colonnade. And as soon as you go, you're going to be called hun and feel like you're a regular there. So that's definitely a place people have to, to go. Another kind of institution, um, oh, that, okay, also we had a couple of that said the, um, the Colonnade. Great. For some reason, I can only see a few, I can only see some of the answers. So be sure you're putting your answers in the one where everybody can see it. Um, so our next one is really um, a, a character that I think a lot of people remember. This was uh, Miss Anne Price, and Anne grew up in Sylvania, Georgia. She was the fourth of 11 kids, and her brother says she was really bossy, and I think anyone that has been to her place, yep, Stephanie and Tamara got it, yep. So Anne was known for her rules. She was known to really rule her snack bar with a with a uh, iron fist. Well, what I didn't know was after high school, she was actually going to become a beautician. She went to beauty school and to pay for it, she worked in restaurants. Well, it turned out she enjoyed restaurant life more than she actually enjoyed being in beauty school. So she, in 1974, she bought a Tasty Dog franchise and eventually she changed the name to Ann's Snack Bar. The only problem was she was making burgers and things, but she was just down the road from fast food places like McDonald's and Burger King. So how was she going to compete? I mean, these fast food chains have national commercials and marketing campaigns. They've got economies of scales. What did she have? Well, one of her customers said, hey, Anne, you live in the hood. You should call it the hood burger or the ghetto burger. And that's what she did. She branded her burgers as the ghetto burger and the hood burger. And in 2007, the Wall Street Journal said that the ghetto burger was the best burger in the United States. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, 
yeah, so this is Ann's snack bar. It's really tiny. There's only like eight seats inside. So most of the seating is outside in a covered patio. It's very informal. You're basically sitting at folding tables with plastic chairs, things like that. And she was known for her rules. And so you can see all of her rules here about you can't lean on the counter, you can't put babies on the counter. Each of these rules were created in reaction to something that happened. Now she passed away in 2015, but her rules are still there. Um, her Some of her siblings now run the snack bar and they've made some changes. Like now you can pay with a credit card and I think you can call in your orders now, things that Miss Ann would never have allowed, but it's definitely an institution that y'all should check out. And if you're wondering, the ghetto burger is two patties. So one pound of beef, two slices of cheese, homemade chili, lettuce, tomato, onion, mustard, mayonnaise, ketchup, and bacon on a brown bun. So it's a pretty substantial meal. All right, so I mentioned earlier that this was a city of transplants and I wanna tell a story about um, Jesus and Martha Lopez. So they actually came to the United States from Mexico on the back of Jesus's motorcycle when Martha was pre when she was pregnant and they moved to Atlanta because they heard it was pretty affordable and they actually moved into this little area called Taco Town. It was called Taco Town because a lot of people that lived there were Mexican and in their apartment complex it was mainly them and a bunch of single men and so Martha started making food out of her kitchen and just kind of selling plates to the men that lived in the building and their family grew. They ended up with five kids and they um, in 1994, moved to a house in McDonald Street, and they continued to still serve food out of the house. But now they had a living room and a dining room, so people actually dined inside their house. Most of their clientele were Latino, except for um, one guy. There's one white guy who was a, a police officer that went there, and he loved the food. But he's like, you guys, you can't do this. It's not legal. Like, you know, you might get in trouble. I'm really worried about that. So he really encouraged them to buy um, a restaurant. So they found this old grocery store on Memorial Avenue, and they spent three years fixing it up and turning it into a restaurant. On opening day, they only serve 15 customers. But now if you go like at lunchtime, dinner time, it is packed. It is hard to get in because there's huge portions, great food, and it's all reasonably, reasonably priced. Um, so yes, several people have guessed that we're talking about Mi Barrio over on Memorial. And it's still totally family run. They make the tortillas from scratch, not just every day, but they actually make them to order. Um, they only make 10 chili rellenos a day. So when they're gone, they're gone. Um, Martha's Pozzoli, her red Pozzoli, she only makes on Fridays and Saturdays. And if you go on your birthday and let them know, they will give you a shot of their very best tequila in a rather risque, uh, shot glass. So that's a fun thing um, to check out. All right, you guys are guessing it. I think Stephanie and Mona and uh, Valley, you guys are the ones that are really, you guys are getting this. All right, a couple more. So I think I mentioned one of the great things about Atlanta is just the way that not only do we have people from different cultures, but how they often mix and kind of create something new and special. Um, so this is a uh, Gian. Uh, Gian was uh, basically the Britney Spears of South Korea in the 80s. She was a big K-pop star. And when she kind of got over that life of being a celebrity and all that comes along with that, she and her then husband moved to the United States and they opened a couple of restaurants. Well, she enjoyed running the restaurants, but found it hard to work with different chefs. And sometimes it's just hard to find a good chef. And so after her divorce, she decided to go um, to the Cordon Bleu and learn to cook herself. And she just found her passion with cooking. It was something that just she really loved. One of her first restaurant jobs here in Atlanta, she met Cody Taylor. And Cody had been working in restaurants since he was 15. He was like the Southern guy. And the two of them just hit it off and started dating. And on their dates, she would take him to Korean restaurants and teach him about Korean barbecue and bonton and, and things like that. And Cody would take her to meet in threes and to barbecue shacks. And they soon realized that they had a lot of similar ingredients and styles of cooking and that they really complemented each other. So they started cooking out of their shared pantry and created a really unique form of barbecue. And so everything they do really has both a Southern barbecue and Korean influence. So here you see the spicy Korean pork sandwich, which has kimchi coleslaw and cucumber banchan on the side. And they put miso in their collards, Korean peppers in the mac and cheese, and their onion rings are actually tempura. So yes, 
I'm talking about Erlen Barbecue. Um, and so Erlen Barbecue, it's it's right next to a little liquor store. It's, you can't sit inside. You have to take the food um, with you. And it is BYLB, so it's a good idea to um, go next door and pick up your, your liquor or something to drink beforehand. Um, yeah. All right. So I've got one more story to tell. And I think it's a, one of the more unique um, concepts here in Atlanta. And so that's one of the things I was thinking about in writing the book. Um, so this is Kevin Gillespie, and you might recognize him from being on Top Chef. He was the executive chef and co-owner of Woodfire Grill, which was like a really fancy restaurant with white tablecloths. You could easily spend like $200 to $300 per person on dinner. And one day he was talking to his mom and he's like, mom, how come you and dad never come to the restaurant? Now his parents are pretty working class and like they could not afford hundreds of dollars for dinners, but he was the owner. Like they would have eaten for free. So he's like, why don't you guys come to the restaurant? And his mom said, Kevin, the reason we don't come to the restaurant is your dad's worried that we're going to embarrass you. And Kevin was heartbroken because he had no idea that this restaurant, I mean, yes, he knew it was fancy and he knew it was expensive, but he didn't know that it was intimidating and didn't feel welcoming to people like his parents. And so he really wanted to fix that. He really wanted to create a new concept where there's fine dining in a really casual atmosphere. So you won't find white tablecloths at this place. In fact, you won't find tablecloths at all. And the napkins are actually bandanas. Everything's very casual. He also wanted to tear down the wall between the kitchen and the guests, both literally and figuratively. And so one of the ways he did that is one, you can see there's no wall. People can look into the kitchen. The other thing is the chefs actually come out to your table and show you the food. They tell you about the dish that they created and you have the option of taking that dish or not. And one of the reasons why he did this, not only to make it more um, approachable, is he realized he was creating a bunch of different restaurants. I mean, the guy kind of has a culinary empire here in Atlanta. So he knew he wasn't gonna be there all the time to make sure that the quality of food was really good. Um, and so he wanted to figure out how to make it that the chefs really had ownership of their dishes. He also really wanted to give the chefs some experience because what happens in most restaurants is the executive chef comes up with the menu and then everybody else just has to execute on it. And they don't really get to have that creative freedom. So what he did is he came up with a system where they would assign people a type of dish. So each of the chefs would be responsible for one or two different dishes. And then they would go and they would get to create it themselves and they would pitch it to the rest of the staff by making it for them, sharing it with them at a, a family meal. And then they would cook that dish. They would do all the pricing, ordering and presenting that to the people um, that, you know, the guests. So I think a, few, a couple of people have guessed what we're talking about. This would be Gun Show, which is over in Ormwood. Now, Gun Show is one of those places where things have changed a little because of COVID. So now it's a 10 course tasting menu. I believe the chefs still do come out and um, show you the dish, but it is a tasting menu, whereas before it was a little bit more like, um, more like a dim sum place where they would, you get to decide what you wanted. It is really hard to get a reservation. So one little tip I have is that if you go early, there are three or four outdoor tables. Um, and if you get there early, you can get one of those tables. They do not take reservations for those. So they're always available, you know, first come first serve and you can order a la carte there, which is more affordable and it's, it's great. I did it with some friends a couple of weeks ago. And the reason this is called Gun Show is because Kevin's dad, he worked three jobs you know, seven days a week, but he'd always take off time to go to this monthly flea market and gun show. And so Kevin named it gun show and said, dad, I know you'll go to the gun show. So you have no excuses now. So I think it's a really fun concept, but I also really love this story behind that one. Now, there are a couple other places that I just think are super un unique in Atlanta um, that I think some people are surprised to see in the book. Um, so I want to talk really quickly about some of the more unique locations that you'll find in the book. One is the Frosty Caboose over in Chambly. It is a um, Missouri Pacific rail train caboose. 
that's turned into an ice cream shop. So you can get um, all sorts of ice creams and sundaes. It's all locally made um, ice cream from Greenwood Ice Cream. Um, and I think that's a really fun place to take kids because not only is it a caboose, but there is a train line right behind it. It's right by Marta. It's near the uh, Peachtree um, Airport, the DeKalb Peachtree Airport. So you can see planes taking off. And also there's a bunch of car dealerships nearby and they have people test drive on that road. So if your kids are into plane, trains, and automobiles and ice cream, it's a really fun place to go. Another place people are surprised to see that I put in the book um, is the Starlight Drive-In. And the Starlight Drive-In is down on Moreland. And you know, it's like drive-in movie theater at night. But on the weekends during the day, there is a flea market. And I think that's one of the best uh, Mexican street food that you can find in the city. You know, you'll find things like lote and Mexican styles, uh, tacos and all sorts of stuff. It's really affordable. It's only 50 cents to get into the flea market and the food's super affordable. And so I think that's a fun little adventure that I recommend to everyone. And then one place that I had never been before, oh, that's also at the flea market. You can see all the people lining up to get their food. A place I've never been before um, is the 57th Fighter Group. Has anyone been there before? It is like you're no longer in Atlanta. You drive up this long um, driveway and you start to see like broken down World War II Jeeps. And then you arrive at this um, French farmhouse that looks like it's been bombed because there's you know damage up at the top and it's kind of falling apart. And you go in, there's sandbags. And so it's a World War II themed restaurant. There's memorabilia inside about World War II. And one of the coolest things is one whole wall is windows and it looks on to the DeKalb Peachtree Airport runway. So you can actually sit there and watch planes take off and land. You can ask for a set of headset of set of headphones where you can actually listen to the control tower, which is really fun. So it's another fun place to take people um, who maybe are into World War II history or really into planes or it also just has really good food. Like their beer cheese soup is amazing. Their burgers are great because they make it with the trimmings from the steaks that they cut every day. So I think those are pretty fun. Um, one thing that I always asked people when I went to interview them was I had asked them to tell me about um, something that the regulars know that a new person might not know, because I really want people to have the best experience when they try these restaurants. And so I often ask if there's anything on the menu or not on the menu that people could order. And so that's one thing you'll get in the book is some secret menu items. Uh, for example, over at Ticonderoga Club, every night before they close down the kitchen, they make a ton of bacon, egg, and cheese sandwiches. And they just make them and then they keep them in the warming drawer after the kitchen is closed. The reason why they do this is they wanted to have a place where people who work in the industry as waiters and cooks and dishwashers could go when they get off of work, go for a drink, but also get some food. And so that's kind of their secret late night menu. Um, you won't find the menu, but you can always ask for it and see if they still have some. Another place that has a secret menu is the Vortex. So their secret menu is actually online and um, you have to kind of look around the website to actually unlock the secret menu. But I will say that it helps to think like a pirate and remember that X marks the spot. Um, and also Sublime Donut has a secret donut every day, which I didn't know about. So that's something you can ask. They also um, do like funnel cake. Um, it's not on the menu, but it's something you can ask for when you go there. So those are a couple of the kind of tips that you'll find um, in the book. Now I did want to, um, there's just so much in the book. So I thought it'd be fun if we could play a little bit of trivia. So I've given Joe some questions that he's going to ask you guys and, uh, see how much you guys know about Atlanta restaurants. And, you know, now that you all have had a chance to warm up, um, you know, don't forget that we will be monitoring the chat. So if you are using it, you'll see the little blue bar make sure it says panelists and attendees. So go ahead and check that, hit the little upside down um, triangle and you can switch to panelists and attendees. That way we all can see it. And let's see how much y'all know about our Atlanta restaurants. And if you've read the book, you'll know all the answers, so. <laughs> so the first question is, which food hall was formerly the home of Tyler Perry Studios? Okay, I feel like Alex Trebek, but I need music. 
but I don't want us to get busted for copyright. So think of it in your head. Sing, sing that particular theme song for that particular game show in your head while we're doing this. So, so. Tamara, I guess, Krog, Krog Street Market. Does anyone else have a guess? Any other guesses? Well, Tamara is correct. So Krog Street was actually built in 1889 as Atlanta Stove Works, which manufactured potbelly stoves and iron pans. Then it sat empty for about two decades before Tyler Perry moved in. He put his production facilities and headquarters there. They made 16 movies, 14 stage plays, and five TV shows before they moved out and Krog Street Market moved in. Excellent. Well, oh, very good oh. job, Tamara. Sorry, I forgot that I'm doing this too. <laughs> Excellent. Moving on, question number two. What Cuban spot is credited as the first international restaurant on Buford Highway? Is this theme thing, you sing the theme song as you type? You sing the theme song as you type. Tamara's guessing Havana. Vanna Sandwich Shop, any other guesses? I don't know what happened to Mona and Stephanie. They were so active before, okay. Oh, here we have a couple, yep. Nadia Valley came in. Nice. All right, the answer. Yeah, it's Havana Sandwich Shop. So Eddie Hernandez, um, he came to the United States when he was 11 years old. He decided to persuade the owner of a Christmas tree lot on Buford Highway to let him rent out this little building that was on the lot. And in 1976, he opened Havana, Havana Sandwich Shop, which until then there really weren't a lot of international restaurants on Buford Highway and they're credited as being the first one that was immigrant owned. That is, I, I have a story about the Havana sandwich shop. I actually have never eaten there yet um, because I was so upset. My former partner uh, would always go to Savannah sandwich, uh, Havana sandwich shop with a group of coworkers from the CDC. And I would never get an invite and they would just go at the spur of the moment. And um, I came home and, and they were sitting on the couch and said, hey, we're gonna go to the Savannah Sandwich Shop tomorrow. Do you wanna come? And I was like, do you not know? Have you seriously not watched the news? And it was the day that they burnt down and were destroyed. So yeah, I was like, now is the time that you choose to invite me to eat at the Havana Sandwich Shop when they're a smoldering chasm on Buford Highway. Thank you so much. So it's, a, it's kind of like a personal conviction at this point. Well, I'd be happy to go with you. And yes, the, the original location did burn down and then they were in like a strip mall for a while, which is very Buford Highway. And then they actually moved back to the original location. So it's actually in the original location now. And again, I will totally go with you if you need someone to check it out with. Perfect, perfect. That sounds like a, a great post-pandemic lunch day. So, okay, so question three, where can you eat kangaroo on the banks of the Chattahoochee? Raise canoe. Oh, we got, we finally have some tension here. Is it canoe? Uh -huh. Is it raise? They're the only two places we know on the Chattahoochee. Um, do you have a guess, Joe? Um, I've only been to raise. That, that's the only one that, that I've been to, actually. Do they have canoe on the, I mean, do they have uh, kangaroo on the menu? No, I, I had gone there for an author dinner, um, which was wonderful um, because, you know, authors, books, drinks, it turns very, very festive, very fast. Well, I don't think this place has author on the menu, but they do have kangaroo. So this is canoe. And if you've never been, it is gorgeous because basically where this picture is taken right behind you would be the Chattahoochee. And there's a bar right on the water. There's great views from the patio. And the executive chef right now, he's actually from Australia. His name is Matthew Basford, and he brought some of his Australian roots with him, including kangaroo, which you can always find on the appetizer menu. I went for my birthday um, right before the pandemic started, so I recommend it. Excellent. So question number four. Wait a second, Where? wait a second, I have to stop you. I just saw right. the 
Mercury Plum, my father chimed in and he is the one person that is not allowed to play because my dad was uh, my editor in the book. He read the whole thing and had to give me feedback. So <laughs> qualified. Um, <laughs> friends, like to participate. Sorry, we can move on to the next question now. <laughs> Someone was bust. I love this. Love it. Where can you find a polenta party where the chef pours creamy polenta on the table and tops it with assorted meats, vegetables, Parmesan cheese, and olive oil. Oh, that sounds so wonderful. <laughs> oh, and your father is apologizing and says it was your mother. <laughs> All right, so where do they have a polenta party? Any guesses? And Joe, you can guess too. Okay, okay, okay. This, this does sound very familiar though. Very, very familiar. Have I stumped everyone with the polenta party? All right, Stephanie got it. Oh yeah, so it's actually white bulb. And so I have not done this yet. This is like on my post pandemic, you know, dream list. So what they do is they actually put down butcher paper on the table first, and then they pour this really creamy polenta down the middle, top it with meats and veggies, whatever seasonal you know, olive oil, Parmesan, and there's no plates. You just dig in with your fork and it's a private party. Um, you have to have five or more people to do it. It's actually part of a three course meal. It is definitely on my uh, Atlanta bucket list. So if anyone wants to take me out for a polenta party, let me know. Well, that is, that is amazing. And yeah. White Bull is indicator. Uh, I have been to White Bull several times. Um, it has become the go-to spot when my sister and brother-in-law come down for Thanksgiving, it's kind of a combination going out and my birthday gift um, from them. And we've done the chef's table and it is, it is a unbelievable experience. So, I mean, it, it's a, that's a great, great Decatur restaurant. So. Yeah, I mean, they're really known for their homemade pastas, but this is an a, a experience that I'm really excited to try. So yeah, but yeah, whether or not you go for the plunder party or for pasta, it's, it's good eats for sure. Excellent. So question five, what Atlanta institution earned its nickname because of African-American farmers were not allowed to sell inside? So what Atlanta institution earned its, nick its nickname because African-American farmers were not allowed to sell inside? Mm -hmm. I've got one guess for the Sweet Auburn Curry Market. And that would be correct. So it's actually called the municipal market. It's actually the building is owned by the city and it was a place for farmers to come and sell their goods. But they only let the white farmers inside the building and the black farmers would sell their goods on the curb. And so that's why most people know it as the Sweet Auburn Curb Market. Excellent, excellent. And I believe Bill Clinton visited Sweet Auburn uh, because, oh, who is it that makes the, the sweet potato pies there? And he went there when he was campaigning. Okay. And had the sweet potato pies. So okay. he's not in the book, but there is a picture of Obama playing darts at Manuel's Tavern that did make it into the book. There we go. There we go. All so right. Question six. Oh, what Decatur restaurant is located in an 1891 freight depot? Oh, I know So it's a Decatur restaurant located in an old freight depot. I'll give you a hint. They really have really good oysters and cocktails and a caviar menu. I, I, I have had the lovely cocktail that they make there called um, the Southern Baptist that is light and citrusy and it's served with a silver swizzle stick. Wow. And we do have a guest. It is Simple House. Um, so yeah, this is an 1891 freight depot, but the vibe they're actually going for inside was like an old fashioned hotel lobby. So they actually did research and looked at historical hotel menus, like the menus for their lobby bars. And like they found out most of them would have a steak dinner. So they have a steak dinner and they really tried to emulate that kind of feel. It's a really, really tasty place. And I think several of their mixologists have been nominated for James Beard Awards. It's, it's, it's a lovely, lovely restaurant, truly. And they're the same folks that do Watchmen over at Crog Street Market, which has my favorite oyster happy hour in the city because it's really cheap oysters and cheap, really good cocktails. 
Wow, good to know, good to know. So question seven, what East Atlanta Village restaurant was the site of Toastergate in 2018? Does anybody remember Toastergate? Oh, it is. Yes, Kimball House is very sexy, Tamara. Anybody hear about Toastergate back in 2018? Not Argosy, nope. Joe, do you know what this is? Because well, no, I'm, I'm trying to remember what to, that Toastergate was, you know, because like 2018 seems so, so long ago. 2018 seems like 1918 at this point. So, well, it, it may be something that only people that were in the East Atlanta neighborhood Facebook group might know about. Not the flat iron. I might have stumped everyone with this one. Any last guesses? It's Emerald City Bagels. So when they first opened, they did not have a toaster oven. And you know, a lot of people like their bagels toasted, but the mom and daughter who run it, they were against the to having a toaster. Cause they're like, we bake these bagels fresh every morning. This is how they're supposed to be. You wouldn't get, you know, a croissant and put it in the toaster oven. You wouldn't, you know, take a cake and put in the toaster oven. Why are you toasting our bagels? And so they didn't have one to begin with. Also toasting the bagels kind of slows down your ability to get them out. But people in East Atlanta, like, rioted like it was I mean and by rioted I mean posted lots of things on next door in the oh. group. and it got to be known as toaster gate I actually have a t-shirt that says it's like a toaster and it says EAB um they did eventually get a toaster um for they they caved and I have to admit I am one of those people that likes my bagels toasted but don't tell Jackie and Deanna that <laughs> yeah. excellent so question eight 10 questions, so we're almost done with the, the trivia round, folks. What burger joint has a coronary bypass menu in which the burger buns are bacon grilled cheese sandwiches? Mercy. People knew that one, yes. That is the vortex. Um, and that's like, it starts with like a single coronary bypass, which is like one level, and then it goes to like two, and then I think they have a triple decker. And it's one of those things like you want to make sure you have your life insurance and your your healthcare policy and all that before you go in and, and try this meal. Um, I actually haven't tried that yet, but I am going next Thursday and I really want to order it. I'm trying to convince someone to share one with me because I want to try it. That That is almost like, you know, that Luther burger that used to be the burger with the, the Krispy Kreme donuts as the buns. And it's, no, no, <laughs> that, it just seemed too much, so. All right, question nine, our penultimate question, folks. What Philly cheesesteak joint started out in 2014 as a water ice stand in a Dunwoody Shell station? We have two votes for Woody's. I think Woody's is the most popular Philly cheesesteak, but this is actually Big Dave's cheesesteak. And it started off in a gas station. It got so popular that the neighboring businesses were really annoyed because there'd be like people parked in their parking lots, huge lines blocking their businesses. So you move to downtown. And if you go there, there is a long line like around the block any time that you go. And not only do they make these huge cheesesteaks, but they also make egg rolls that are filled with cheesesteak. And they also have a salmon cheesesteak, which is really yummy if you're a pescatarian. So if you haven't tried out Big Dave's, it's um, a fun place to try out. All right, our last question, question 10. Last question this evening, folks. What restaurant has two parking spots reserved for clergy? Two parking spots reserved for clergy. Ah, uh, yes. Stephanie got it right away. That would be Manuel's Tavern. So um, the Archbishop of Atlanta and the Monsignor were regulars at Manuel's, but they complained because sometimes they had to park really far away and they were kind of old and they like, kind of complained to the bar. And so they actually put a, two clergy parking signs in the parking lot and it's reserved for clergy. And both of them have since passed on, but the clergy parking spots are still there and any member of the clergy is welcome to park there. Uh, that is my trivia. Wow. I mean, that's a good argument to get quickly ordained using <laughs> the internet just to have that benefit. Because yes, parking at manuals is, is sometimes a little bit prohibitive. But folks, 
As we wrap up this evening's events, if you all have any specific questions that you would like to ask about restaurants or food or food culture in Atlanta, please feel free to go ahead and type those either into the chat or into the Q&A section so we can ask them. And yes, Tamara, I see we are on the same page. We are on the same page with the clergy um, parking signs. Especially so, now, parking lot is now like apartment building. So I don't even know where you park when you go to manuals anymore if you're not clergy. Yeah, you know, whatever your favorite ride share program is, is probably gonna be the best for that particular area. So I know we were talking earlier uh, before we started the program about a meet and greet coming up this Saturday. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this meet and greet, Amanda? So now that the pandemic is winding down, we don't only have to do things on Zoom, we can actually get together in person again. So on Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., I'm gonna be at Refuge Coffee. Refuge Coffee is actually featured in the book as well, is this amazing coffee shop out in Clarkston um, that hires refugees and it's a job training um, program where they get the skills and get referrals to get jobs. Um, and so we're going to be out there. I'll be signing books. I also have a couple of chefs from Chow Club that will be selling food for lunch. So um, yeah, if you can stop by, um, you also get to meet my editor, Terry Plum. My dad will be there. You have him sign your book. So yeah, I'd love to see folks in person on Saturday and please tell your friends about the book and encourage them to stop by Karis or come um, to the event on Saturday. That, I mean, that is definitely worth the price of admission right there. Refuge coffee and food at the same time, that is absolutely fantastic. So speaking of, of having sort of like an in-house editor and, 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 you know, such for this particular project, were there any restaurant, I always ask the kill your darlings question, were there any restaurants that you left out um, or, you know, maybe restaurants you wanted to include that, you know, you just simply couldn't find the time for interviews or something like that that you couldn't put in the book. 100%. Like this could, this book could be three, four or five times longer. It could be multiple volumes. There's so much food in Atlanta. I just barely scratched the surface. There were some places that I really wanted to interview, but like I could never get a hold of someone um, like Lee's Bakery. I, I called them. I went up there. I was like a little bit of a stalker. Um, wasn't able to get them in. Slutty Vegan, they were just like blowing up all over the place and just didn't have time for an interview. Um, I tried to get Bankhead Seafood. They're just some that were really hard to get in touch with. Um, there are others that I just love, but I was really had to narrow it down. So some of my favorite restaurants to eat in aren't actually in the book. Um, and then there is one in the book that is since closed, which is a Localino, which I like to call Disco Italian, but the owners have opened up a new Italian restaurant in the same place. So um, luckily, um, a lot of the most of the restaurants that are in the book have actually survived the pandemic, which is really exciting. But yeah, I think there's a zillion, I mean, you could do this book just on Buford Highway. You could do this book just on black owned restaurants. You could do this book, you know, just on Southern restaurants. You know, there's so many amazing places in the city. Truly true. I, we, we are definitely blessed in Atlanta. Um, so Valley is asking about Refuge Coffee. It's 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. this coming Saturday. And Tamara is asking, what would you say is the best Italian restaurant in Atlanta? My house. But <laughs> I'm sure there's another, there, there's, you know, there's another answer to that question. So that's a great question. I mean, I think for homemade pasta, I love going to like Amano and Boca Lupo. I mean, those two are definitely incredible places, but I am half Italian. And so I'm one of those people that I'm biased, like, you know, nothing compares to my grandmother's crab and spaghetti. So, you know, it is kind of, it's, it's one of those things, I feel like Italian food is one of the things I go out for least frequently because I just was spoiled growing up with great Italian food. It, exactly the same. My, my friend and roommate during the pandemic who insists that he gained 20 pounds eating um, my great grandmother's lasagna recipe that I make. Um, but it's, it's the same thing. We would decide to say, oh, well, why don't we go out for Italian food? And he's like, because you're going to order it, you're going to take one bite, and you're going to sit there and stare at your plate. So, so if you could put your address in the in the chat we'll <laughs> tomorrow night for dinner, is that good? No, we'll be there for sure. You know, I mean, we can always arrange a date because I mean, you know, I do love nothing more than, than like whipping up a pan of lasagna. It's therapeutic. I, I do have to say that's 
one thing about cooking and the pandemic, it really did become therapeutic as well. And I got to kind of like dive into the old, um, I have a Pendaflex and all of the old recipes um, that my great grandmother used to write down and my grandmother used to write down. It's like, you knew that the peanut butter cookie recipe was good because it still has the like peanut butter grease and like the smears of the chocolate kisses and things like that on it. So yeah, that's been one fun part, I guess, uh, of all of this. <laughs> we should be a chow club. I don't, I don't know whether I'm chow club worthy. I don't know whether I'm chow club worthy. Um, you know, everybody seems to think I cook well. Um, that also could be from the fact that, you know, the DeKalb Farmer's Market is right around the corner and they have a great wine section, which means I have a great wine section. <laughs> They're also in the book, DeKalb Farmer's Market. Um, I think that's one of those places that I take everyone that comes to visit. And speaking of Chow Club, we actually had our tasting yesterday for our first dinner, which is going to be in August. So that's really exciting to be getting back into that. So stay Actually, that, that sounds like a very, very fun thing as well. So, yeah. well, folks, thank you all so much for joining us. Amanda, thank you so much for joining us this evening and really giving us this delightful and beautifully bound checklist. Um, I'm sure for every Atlanta foodie, we will have this thing well thumbed through. Um, and, you know, it's a perfect gift too for foodies who even visit the city as well. I'm, I'm sure I'll have one sent to my sister and brother-in-law. Yeah. Um, my, pa my parents have a copy and they're coming um, tomorrow actually. And they each emailed me a list of where they wanted to go. And so um, we are going out to dinner at spring up in Marietta uh, for dinner. And we're gonna be ordering takeout from Talat Market. And then we're either gonna go to Crawfish Shop Shack or Taqueria del Sol. So those, and maybe we'll stop by Cafe Intermezzo. Those are all places that they haven't been yet, but we're excited once they read about them in the book. So it is fun to give to people out of town, people that just moved to town. And I think if you're ever like, feel like you're in a rut, it's a great thing to flip through. Um, but also I think there's stories in here about even places that you know, and you thought you knew. Um, and again, it's my love letter to the city after the restaurant industry had such a hard year and a half, I really hope we're all gonna get out there and support our local unique eats and eateries of Atlanta. And I hope this you know, gives you some new ideas of where to go. I, I do too as well. Get it, make your list, visit these restaurants, shop at your local indie bookstores. Once again, thank you, Amanda, so very much for this love letter and this lovely program. Thank you all for allowing us into your homes this evening. We know the names in the chat. So maybe, maybe we will be getting in contact with you. I do have some books. I'm in my home office, not in the office office, but you know, I have Jim Ock Moody Smoke Lore. I have Rebecca uh, Mary Bohan's Heritage Cooking Book. So we may have some treats for you in store. We'll be getting in contact with you all. Thank you so much for joining this evening. We will see you on Saturday at Refuge Coffee and we will see you back here on Zoom very, very soon. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Hello. Thanks.